Well, hello everyone. This is uh, Pastor Travis. I'm excited to be with you again today. And we're continuing session three uh, in the book of Revelations on the letter to the churches. And so this is an exciting time. I want to start uh, this session as well in Revelations chapter one, verse three. And this is so awesome. Such a great promise. It says here, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So this is important because this book is not just a prophecy of the end times, but it's a way of preparing our hearts. There's doctrine, there's teaching uh, in this, this book, which helps us to calibrate our lives and to perfect our lives for, for the return of the Lord. Some wonderful teaching here in the letters to the seven churches. And um, as you know, in the last couple of weeks, we talked about different churches here. There was a letter written to the Loveless Church, the church that was struggling um, with loving the Lord. It was all about head knowledge. We talked about the church of Ephesus, and this letter was written in the first century to that specific church. There was also the persecuted church, which is the church uh, in Smyrna. Who was They were enduring persecution during the first century. This was written to that church. The compromising church is written to the church in Pergamos. And this week we want to talk um, about the church of Thyatira. And so if you haven't heard those other teachings, I want you to go back and watch them. Uh, there's some good material there. To help us understand what they were dealing with in this first century, but also how it can relate to our own personal lives and, and where, it, where it speaks to us dispensationally throughout history. And so today I want to talk about the church uh, in Thyatira. And so it says here in verse 18 of chapter 2, it says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira I write, okay? These things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Well, let's stop there for a minute and let me give you a little overview of Thyatira. Thyatira was a morally compromising church in a commercial city with numerous trade merchants. Each of these trade merchants had their own patron deity. And so, so the city sponsored idolatrous feasts and there were orgies uh, that took place with those feasts. So there was sexual sin and there was idolatry happening uh, as part of the culture of uh, the way they run their economy. Thyatira was famous for woolen goods and royal purple dye. And so they, purple dye was very hard to, to come by and they had mastered it in Thyatira. So kings and nobles, people came from all over the world to get this royal purple dye and cloth that was made with this dye. And so that's what they were famous for, uh, is for that dye. In Acts chapter 16, verse 14 and 15, we actually read about a woman named Lydia. And now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira. And so she was a woman who was selling this. She worshiped God and the Lord opened to her, or sorry, the, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she ha and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and, and stay. So she persuaded them. I think this is important because many believe that Lydia was probably the first Christian. Her family was probably the first Christians in Thyatira and she sold purple and so there was a church established probably in her home okay and so uh, she was from Thyatira now these guiles or trade merchants um, they operated in a similar way as Freemasons do today okay so basically commerce and trade was tied to certain rituals uh, and spiritual rituals okay in the guilds fellowship meals when they had what they called fellowship meals in at these trade parties food was first sacrificed to idols and after the meals orgies were frequently uh, occurring it was through participation in these events that commercial and financial security uh, was assured so so the city was basically sponsoring uh, idolatrous, uh, idolatrous feasts and also uh, sexual orgies. Okay, this is kind of a, a, a very hard culture to live in as a Christian. And so as a Christian, you would struggle to advance financially unless you cooperated at the fellowship meals. 
So if you didn't come and if you weren't promiscuous and and uh, idol, you know, worshiping idols and eating food sacrificed to idols, um, if you weren't participating in all this stuff, uh, you were going to have a hard time making a living because that was part of their culture. And so it's very important to note this because in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15 and 17, the scripture tells us this. Paul says, do you not know that your bodies are part of Christ himself? Am I to take a part of Christ and make it part of a woman who sells her body? No, never. So Paul is basically forbidding sexual sin. Do you not know that a man who joins himself to a woman who sells the use of her body uh, becomes a part of her? For the holy writings, the Bible says, the two shall become one flesh. But if you join, but if you join yourself to the Lord, you are one spirit with him. So our bodies belong to the Lord. And if you're married, they belong to your spouse. Okay, your body does not belong to any other sexual indulgence out there. And so in verse 18, uh, again, here in this passage, Jesus is identifying with their struggle and he reminds them. He says here, OK, these things, says the son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Uh, his eyes are like a flame of fire. What does fire do? Fire burns away the dross. Fire purges. When you put metal in fire, the impurities in the metal come to the surface. And if it's gold, you have pure gold in the bottom and all the impurities will come to the surface. And Jesus says, I have eyes like fire and I'm looking into the hearts and minds of my people and I want to refine you. And, and that fire comes to refine. And so Jesus is saying, I can identify and I'm coming here because I want to I, I want to bring change. I want to see things in your life burnt away that are not of me. And then he says, and also I have feet like brass, like fine brass. Now, brass in scripture always represents judgment. So he says, I want to come to give you an opportunity to repent. If you refuse to repent, then there is always judgment that comes after that. But even in the midst of where church is corrupted and obviously some of the churches is compromising uh, and going with the culture, uh, he commends them because this is the heart of God. Even though we're struggling, we're going through our stuff, he always wants to commend. He always wants to point out the areas where we're strong and he wants us to work in the areas where we're not doing so well. And look what he says here. I know your works, this is verse 19. Your love, your service, your faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. So he's saying, I, I see that you love. You, you love people. You love God. You have service. You have faith. You have patience. You can endure. These are all good things. And Jesus said, I'm, I'm proud of you in these areas. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Now, I want you to understand this. Who's he speaking to? Okay, he speaks, he's speaking specifically to the pastor or the messenger of the church of Thyatira. He has to have something against you. And here's what he says. Because you allow that woman, okay, Jezebel. Now, I know people read the scripture and they say Jezebel is a spiritual principality. And yes, there is a principality, a spiritual force, a demonic entity, called the Jezebel spirit. Okay, I understand that. But in this passage of scripture, he's speaking about a woman. Okay, he's speaking about, so there was a false teacher. There was a woman who was operating in the church. And he says, I have this few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, okay, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. In other words, there's a woman that you've given leadership to and she and you've allowed her. And again, she calls herself a prophetess. She's self-appointed. OK, so first of all, be careful of self-appointed leaders. If someone starts a church in their home and says, you know, God called me to do this. Well, are you self-appointed? Is there a denomination behind you? Is there a ministry behind you? Are there men and women around in eldership leadership positions that can say, 
you know, you know, they're they're appointed. We see the calling of God in their life. Be careful not to follow self-appointed leaders. Very dangerous, okay? She called herself a prophet, Tess, and he allowed her to have authority, okay? He allowed her to seduce people, probably to go to these merchant meetings and to eat food sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual, it's okay, you can do it, God understands. So there was a woman named Jezebel, her name could have been Mary, it could have been anything, or it could have been Jezebel. Jezebel means, that word actually means chaste. Her name could have been Jezebel. But Jesus is probably just calling this woman by her um, her temperament or the way she, she responds like the Jezebel who is Ahab's wife. That's probably what's happening here. She calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and seduces my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And then verse 21 says, and I gave her time to repent. See, if this was dealing with just a spirit, God doesn't give spirits time to repent. They're disembodied spirits, they're called demon spirits, and there's no repentance, there's only justice coming for them. But he gave this woman time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. So important to understand here, Jesus says this woman, this prophetess, this, this self-appointed leader, um, I've given her time to repent, her time's up. She's in a sick bed and all of her followers that are following her teachings, um, they're gonna follow suit. They're gonna follow where the same pathway she took unless they repent of their deeds. And so there's still hope of repentance for the rest of the people following her. And then verse 23 says, I will kill her children with death this is not talking about kids, like little kids, because there's an age of accountability. We understand that. She's talk, the Lord's talking about killing her children. He's talking about killing the, um, uh, the, the offspring of this demonic doctrine that was being produced, okay? The offspring, those who are following the teaching of Jezebel, which we're going to talk about in a second, okay? And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your work. Okay. Now, very important that we, we, we note this here. Um, rather than, than allowing the Lord to confirm her ministry within the church, she, she was self-proclaiming herself and her function. Okay, We have to be careful. That's number one of self-appointed leaders. But the doctrine of Jezebel is really this. After all, I'm going to read this little write-up here. So after all, Jezebel would have reasoned, this, this woman would have reasoned, if Christ has set us free from all things and has paid the price for all things, then we must be free to participate in whatever we desire to do, for it can do us no harm. This is what she reasoned. Moreover, if we withdraw from the organizations such as the trade guilds, who is going to witness to our former friends and colleagues? Therefore, the Thyatirians would have been encouraged to take part in these things that were evil in God's eyes, immorality, okay, and eating foods that have first been offered to idols, okay, so that they may prove the abundance and the immeasurable resources of God's grace towards them, while at the same time witnessing to others for the provision of the cross, okay? So, so basically the teaching of Jezebel is trying to synchronize two opposing ways of living. In other words, that teaching pampers the old nature instead of crucifying it, right? That teaching says, well, I can live with one foot in the world and I can live with one foot in the church. And, you know, even if the Bible says, and the Bible does say that we're to, to go and we're to be a witness to people, and we're to love people and we're to share the gospel with people. So the Lord has called us to come out from among them and be separate says the Lord. That's what the scripture says. You need to come out from among them and be separate, yet we're still to go into the world. And we're still to have relationships with those who are far from God for how can we reach them? But what we're not supposed to do is we're not supposed to participate with some of maybe their lifestyle choices, things they're doing that um, would be forbidden according to scripture. So we got to love and be with people, but not participate. And I think this is what uh, what was happening in, in this situation is that they were participating uh, with the intent of maybe winning people over. And that's just not never, never, ever a biblical thing to do. Now, I want to read on here. He says here, 
in verse 24, Jesus says, Now to you I say, he's speaking again now to the messenger or the pastor of the church, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine. What doctrine? The doctrine of Jezebel, okay? This compromising doctrine. As many as do not have this doctrine who have not known the depth of Satan, as they say. So the depth of Satan, just talking about how evil this teaching is. This live however you want. You can have do one foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom. Not a problem. You're saved. It's all good. That That is a, just a terrible, terrible. It's called the depths of Satan here. Jesus refers to it. He says, to these people who are not compromising, who are standing fast, look what he says. I will put on you no other burdens. Basically, Jesus is saying, I'm not going to put any burdens on you because you're, you are fighting the good fight. You're dealing, in a, you're dealing in a corrupt society trying to get along. Um, he says, I'll put no burden on you, but hold fast what you have till I come. Hold on to the truth that you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give the power over the nations. And so here's the thing. Um, I believe that the promise was this, okay? I will give you power over the nations in the life to come. Why? Because you were willing to sacrifice your status in a society that was corrupt in order to remain faithful to the Lord. So he's saying, you know what? You, 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 you could have been more prosperous, but you chose to stay righteous. And so for that, don't worry in eternity. You're going to have power over nations. I'm going to give you that as a reward. God is so faithful. And so here's the thing. The next promise he gives them, he says, I promise here, the next promise this is, he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He will rule them with the rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. The morning star is really Jesus himself. And I believe it's not specific. Jesus doesn't explain this, but I believe personally, it's just really talking about the very presence. I will give you the presence of God to be with you in eternity. This is wonderful. He who has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, I want you to, to understand this here. Uh, dispensationally, this church really, many scholars believe this church represents uh, the church during the Middle Ages um, because it was full of self-appointed leaders. There was a lot of demonic doctrines and there was corruption. And so we believe that that specifically dispensationally speaks of, of that time and that era. Okay. And how does all this relate to us today? I mean, corruption in the church. Well, I love what Elijah says and in his time as the prophet, thousands of years before, um, he had to deal with Jezebel, uh, who was the wife of Ahab, and who had brought in all kinds of pagan worship and idolatry into the nation as well. And he had to speak to the people, and this is what he said. Elijah went before the people and he said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. And so here, here's the thing. He was saying, make a choice. You're either in the kingdom or you're in the world. None of this flip-flopping anymore. And this is what the doctrine of Jezebel does. It allows you to live uh, a life that uh, includes a lot of sin, yet you still call yourself a child of God and you still maybe attend church. Listen, God wants you to make a choice. God wants you, if you're living and you've grabbed a hold of that doctrine, he wants you to repent and um, and he's willing to forgive. He's merciful and he's just, okay? I want to look at Romans chapter 6, verse 1 to 2, because we're talking about how this relates today. Uh, Paul says, Well then, should we keep on sinning so God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in sin? Okay? And then Romans six fifteen to 16, he says, Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become a slave to whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Okay, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, right? And another thing to note here is sexual sin, the Bible says, is different from other sins. Since we're talking about sexual immorality and idolatry, 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, I'm reading out of the Passion Translating, Paul says this, This is why you must keep running away from sexual immorality. You have to run away from it. Why? For every other sin a person commits is external to the body. It's something that's committed outside of the body. But immorality involves sinning against your own body. All right? So you can open the door um, for disease in your body. You can open up the door for an attack of the enemy in your life. I believe that's what it means. I don't have time to get into the details of that. But if you are involved uh, in sexual sin, repent and renounce it. Just say, God, I repent. It's wrong. I accept the eyes of fire that are looking into, into my heart and mind. And I repent. And I ask you, God, to forgive me and cleanse me. And secondly, if you need to get, if you need to get help, um, you can get help. There's freedom in Christ. There's people in the Lord that would be willing to talk with you about it because uh, sexual sin can be addictive as well. And so get help. But make a choice to walk free of idolatry and sexual sin. To say, God, I want to put my faith in you. Amen? And so let me just close with this prayer. I could spend, you know, this is the longest letter to... In, in regards to the seven churches, this one is the longest. There's a lot of a lot of stuff we could talk about. We could spend hours just on this church. Um, but let, let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we ask God that you would, we allow your eyes of fire to come and search us and to purge us because we don't want your feet of brass. Because God, because you're holy and righteous, you need to bring judgment. But we choose mercy. And God, if there is sin in our lives, um, there's compromise where we have, um, and it might not even be sexual, but we have our feet in the world and we're doing things the world's doing that we know is, is, is not lawful according to your word. It's sinful. And we're doing it and we're okay with it. And our consciences may be our seared. God, I ask that you would let those eyes of fire come into our life. We want to repent and we want to put our faith in you and we want to walk faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope this uh, teaching has been a blessing to you. I know it's a little bit of a hard one, but it's it's a reality of um, a day that we live in where things 20 years ago that were considered like unthink you would, unthinkable are now uh, becoming the norm. And, and it's, just, it's just a very dark time. So Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessing. Bless your people. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name.